are planning on burning out the door uh, prior to lunch, uh, make sure you leave your name badge and get your mug if you haven't done so. Um, as far as lunch is concerned, I'll remind you of this also after this next session. Um, we're going to check if you are going to be staying for lunch here. Uh, we ask that you kind of move through the buffet line quickly so we can get to the plenary speaker. If you are not um, signed up for lunch, there's also a cafeteria up the hill. So um, now I'd like to introduce Lee Gillis, who is uh, from the Herring Ponds Watershed Association, down where I live. Um, and he's going to be the moderator for the outreach session. Uh, has uh, multiple fabulous speakers. So, Lee. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, I would have to say that uh, I would thank the donors as well, um, especially for the conference and Plymouth Plantation, especially for this wonderful venue that we have. Um, One of our speakers is Kim Van Warmer, who is the program manager for the Plymouth Grist Mill and is in charge of the second annual Herring Festival that takes place uh, at the Grist Mill tomorrow and Sunday. So she'll be able to tell us more about that. I'm sure a lot of you will want to attend that. Uh, I'm vice president and education chairman for the Herring Ponds Watershed Association. And we don't have a whole lot of donors to thank. Uh, we're all volunteer, very low budget, uh, but we do have about 250 uh, folks on our email list that are concerned about the watershed that we uh, are volunteer stewards of. It is an area of critical environmental concern designated by the state, uh, 4,500 acres, and it has a uh, river herring run on it, which is the herring run used to stock adult alewives into the other runs in Massachusetts. So um, it has a county right on the Cape Cod Canal. It's very accessible. It's a very simple uh, river system and, and pond system in that uh, it has no tributaries. Uh, Great Herring Pond and Little Herring Pond are the two ponds that are connected by the Carters River and they flow to the Cape Cod Canal through the Herring River. We're also in the Atlantic Coastal Pine Barren, so we feel that the fish have unique uh, amino acid markers and so forth and, and represent a very good research site. And this is the first year we are doing a volunteer uh, herring count. Um, it's been done for 25 years with an electronic counter at the Cape Cod Canal, and now we're seeing, okay, they get in from the canal, how many of them get into the Great Herring Pond spawn? So we're just uh, beginning that, and so far we've had two weeks of volunteer counting going, and so far we have zero fish. A uh, very, very interesting thing, because to the north of us, to the west of us, on the Cape Cod, etc., the fish are all running. Uh, the counters showed 300,000 fish came through last year at the canal, and uh, we think it's uh, not running in our system because we have a 20 to 40 foot deep uh, glacial Pond that is 370 acres. The ice just went out on April 5th, so it's colder than the other runs all around us. Uh, but uh, that in itself would make it an interesting research site. Our panel today, though, is involved in outreach, and uh, it's comprised of three diverse environmental educators, I would say, uh, each of whom will describe how they are leveraging their outreach for increased impact. It's one thing to do outreach, our association does it, but when you can leverage that to reach more people and have more impact, that's, that's what we want to talk about today, I think. Uh, more information is available of these uh, folks, their backgrounds, on the uh, conference website. I'll briefly introduce all of the panelists now, and then each will present their topic, followed by a question or two from me. And then at the end, we'll have time for questions from the audience. Uh, Lou Ann Conroy, first here, is a Plymouth South High School biology teacher who uses the Herring Ponds Watershed Stewardship Guide, which our association wrote, and it looks like 
this, and you can find it on the back of the table over there. Uh, she uses that in her classes uh, with a study guide that she developed and freely offers to other teachers. And there are 20 copies of the study guide that Luann developed that go along with the stewardship guide on the table over there. Um, her assignment includes AP Biology, Environmental Science, Oceanography, and General Biology. She brings a variety of aquatic and marine research experience uh, at Woods Hole, Marine Biological Lab, the Woods Hole Oceanographic, and Dartmouth College to her profession. She's an avid conservationist. She's a member of the Sandwich Conservation Commission and continues to volunteer her time in conservation organizations in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont. The next speaker that we'll have will be Gloriana Davenport. She's a trustee of Tidmarsh Farms, a founder of the Living Observatory, and a founding member of the MIT Media Laboratory, where she currently serves as visiting research scientist. Today, uh, Ms. Davenport leads a 250-acre comprehensive freshwater wetlands restoration project for Tidmarsh Farms. In 2011, this effort became a priority project for Massachusetts Fish and Game Division of Ecological Restoration. And I believe we have those, some of those folks here. Okay. Um, the project is the largest such restoration undertaken in the state has attracted 22 partners and funders and will be in construction in 2015. Stamport will share insights about creating a living observatory, which is an internet-based uh, project, an ecological learning collaboratory. Did you create that one? <laughs> That's a great one. Collaboratory. Formed to document and interpret the landscape scale process based freshwater wetland restoration. And on the end, we have Kim Van Warmer, who is the program manager for Plymouth Plantations Gristmill and former director of education uh, at Plymouth Plantation, where she oversaw the museum's education programming, the production of curriculum and teacher training materials, online activities and curriculum, and professional development programs for teachers. Kim has a BA in American History and Museum Studies from the State University of New York at Oswego. Kim will relate how to organize a local watershed awareness and education event, aka the second annual River Herring Festival, as she has done with Plymouth, Plymouth Plantation. And I hope you will be able to attend tomorrow and Sunday. So ladies, this is alphabetical, and, and Lou Ann is first up. And uh, we're going to give you five minutes to present. And we have some slides. And then I'll follow up with uh, a question or two. And then we'll move on to Gloriana and some questions afterwards. And then to uh, Kim. And then after that, uh, there will be questions from the audience. Okay. We'll try to keep on time. So I think you have a mic there, and I'll keep this moving for a while. I'm just using mics, just my loud voice in class. Um, thank you, it's an honor to be here. Um, I guess to start with, I, um, this is only my third year teaching in Plymouth, but I grew up here and I probably fell in love with the natural world here. I grew up um, near Newfield Street and watched the herring run there um, back when they probably had trouble getting from the ocean to the pond to fresh water. Um, so I've spent most of my time, um, 30 years, about teaching in Vermont and New Hampshire, but I'm back home teaching up from the South High School now. And um, wherever I've taught, I've tried to uh, give my students a sense of place. So I start all my courses, regardless if it's AP Bio or General Bio, Oceanography, Environmental Science, with Google Earth images coming in from the planet into Plymouth itself. Um, we talk about what they see, what is our place, what can they see from this perspective. Um, as you can imagine, high school kids, juniors and seniors are, they get on the bus, they take their car, they barely get to school on time, they're rushed, we 
they spend their day in school and they leave, they rush on the roads to get to work and back and forth on the roads um, for the most part. So talk about that. A lot of them though um, use the ponds, the watershed as a place to swim and fish. Some of their parents, with their livelihoods from the oceans. Um, so we talk about sort of living in the systems that they can see that we talk about in terms of the watershed. Um, through the course, I hope um, they get a sense of the connectivity and the connections that they have with the natural world, um, as well as um, the co connectivities that need to exist between the components of a watershed. So what I can do is take students um, out to these components and do field work. So that's, that's basically my sort of role, and um, I'm, I think it's imperative, especially now, I've been teaching about 30 years, that we keep, we get kids outside um, to do science, uh, connect them with their town through science. Um, so that's how I design my courses. I use seasons and my favorite place. Um, and I'll go to the yeah, why don't, why don't you continue a bit? I know you have some more slides and, mm -hmm. and you want to tell about how you use uh, print materials in particular. Um, yeah, I, I tend to, I have textbooks, but I tend to take, um, for example, um, the Herring Ponds Watershed. So publications from organizations, some of them are here. Um, the Pine Barrens Alliance, Manonet Center for Conservation Sciences. Um, I utilize um, Huey and MDL publications and develop, develop study guides so my students read those. And as you can imagine, teenagers don't so sit down and read these. Um, so it kind of forces them to focus on <coughs> some local, current, and cutting edge research um, from these organizations and institutions. Um, in addition, I try to um, have members from organizations that represent um, groups of people, adults, who, are, who care about stewardship, stewardship of the land, conservation, um, climate change, science, and have them come into my classroom or have my students go to the institutions. Um, it's important that these kids have a connection to the larger scientific community. Um, it's uh, always fascinating to me sort of the uh, profound effect that it has on students to sort of have those connections with adults who are you know, researching climate, researching sharks, researching uh, water quality fish for a living and have them talk to them, share, you know, share their experiences with them. Okay, great. So Organizations like ours that develop print materials, one thing we did is we gave 300 copies to the science coordinator of Plymouth Public Schools, who then accessed those for her classes, and so all the students could have a copy. Do you let them take that home or keep it? We do, and we use it the um, online as well. Yeah, we also put it's it online. Easy. It's available through our website. So. Actually, that's probably what they use because all that page is clickable links right. for the references. And throughout it, we have uh, internet links. So, uh, your study guide is also available online through our website. If the 20 paper copies don't satisfy you, and, and uh, also uh, uh, there are clickable links in it. Just, just in closing, I guess. Um, what educators are up against, and I feel it, especially this year, is um, what the high, with the high stakes testing, so the MCAS and the PARC. Um, and there's a real pressure on educators to, um, well, administrators to really look at time. So they don't want, there's a movement to not wanting kids out of the school. Um, because the PARC testing, for example, took, um, had my juniors, they missed a whole unit my course in oceanography because of park testing and the problem with that is you have kids sitting in Nebraska and North Dakota taking the same test as kids in Plymouth and you're 
they're assessing what they know, but it's getting them out that you know this is the more meaningful um, types of, of experiences that help them really learn. So it is a pressure that we're feeling, and, and certainly in Plymouth with the school board, um, the movement is to not let kids out because of the time. Um, so we're it's an ongoing dialogue. It's an ongoing process. Okay, great. So we'll move on so we can get all three speakers. And, uh, uh, basically, uh, Luann has been talking about youth in schools and using print materials. And now we'll move on to Gloriana, who's going to talk about her restoration effort in the Internet Living Observatory and researchers and sensors. So all different ways in which you can uh, do your outreach and impact wider groups of people than the world probably. Okay. Um, <clears throat> welcome, everyone. Um, I was fortunate to uh, spend most of my career at MIT, um, at the Media Lab, in an interdisciplinary group of researchers where no one researcher was like the other. So we are uh, a group of researchers, about 30 when I left. Uh, everybody has a different specialty. And the advantage of that is, uh, I think, fairly evident and obvious when you think about the natural world. Uh, there's so many different things you can look at and study. And so that's been very inspirational to me. One of the people who I sort of feel I grew up with at the Media Lab was a man called Seymour Papert. While I was a movie maker, a practicing documentary movie maker, Seymour Papert was interested in how children learned. And he uh, wrote Logo and then did Logo Lego, Lego Logo. And um, he used to talk about hands-on, heads-in learning. And I think it's a wonderful expression of what happens, what you've been talking about uh, in terms of exploring, discovering the natural world, uh, collecting data, but if you're gonna collect data, you have to have an idea of what you're looking at, and uh, you've gotta match the data with that concept in a way. So I wanted to just start there that, um, it's a passion for me, personally. Uh, I have been very fortunate to uh, have married a man many years ago now who uh, wanted to be a farmer because everybody in his family was farmers except him. He happened to be in the financial industry. And uh, he had three, he had a divorce, he had three children he was bringing up in Boston and he wanted them to learn something about a farm. And so through various circumstances, he purchased two farms that are outlined in red there, Tidmarsh Farms with a S. Uh, one was purchased from uh, Richmond, who was a local landowner uh, here in Plymouth, and the other was purchased from Cumberland Farms. Uh, who we know of, uh, very evidently a very, very difficult negotiator. Um, his his uh, criterion for where this farm would be, it had to be an hour from Boston and it had to be able to make money. He wasn't interested in not making money. So, uh, well, he uh, put a lot of money into the farm, he, he cleared it, he used helicopters to take the mud out of the ditches, and one year we did 1% of Ocean Spray's crop, which was quite phenomenal. However, to carry on doing that, you have to use a lot of pesticides and chemicals, um, and uh, over time, uh, he figured out how the children could own the land. Uh, and through, because they were members of the corporation, the farm corporation. The children now own the land, they are very green, they do not like any kind of chemical, they love clean water. Um, Audrey, his middle girl, runs a program called Heat in Cambridge, which helps people assess their heat loss or their, their uh, maximize their energy use uh, in Cambridge. And they didn't really want to live on a farm. 
<laughs> so, what do you do? Now, in my parents' generation, you would leave it for the children to decide later after you're gone. But I thought, oh, that's a lousy position, having been in that position, that's a lousy position to put kids in. So we asked them uh, whether we could start to think about a new trajectory for this beautiful piece of land that I was just thrilled to be a part of. And um, through family discussions in 2008, and with the help of the Wildlands Trust, there's so many people to thank on this journey. Uh, uh, we were introduced to the NRCS WRP uh, group out of uh, Beth Schreier and Amherst, and we figured out, well, we could start by putting a conservation easement on some part of the wetlands. Figuring out exactly what that was is a whole other part of the journey. Learning, learning, learning. Um, and we were very lucky at this time to have that example of the Eagle River watershed very close to us and the example of so many people in Plymouth. I have to say, uh, I grew up um, in New York City and I spent summers in Middletown, New Jersey where there was almost no conservation. It was the most developed place between 1950 and 1960 in the United States. In Plymouth, it seemed like everybody was concerned, and I want to give a big call out to Charlotte Russell, who, for me, was a mentor on this project through thick and thin, what should I do next? Uh, even though I had a five-year plan, I didn't necessarily know how to navigate Plymouth in order to get there. So, um, Charlotte, thank you for everybody. Um, Anyway, I, based on Eel River, uh, uh, or Beth Schreier brought someone called uh, Eric Durlis, who's with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and Alex Hackman to the property one day. And Alex Hackman jumped in the river, helped me take out a baby carriage that had been thrown in, and I said, he's my man. We've got water on this property, and the first thing that we have to do is figure out what to do with the water. And Eric Durlis told me, it's a restoration. If you don't do process-based restoration and do the whole thing, you're not gonna get any money. So, good lessons, okay. Um, so my question was, how can we scale the learning opportunity of this restoration? If we do a big restoration, this landscape's gonna change, and it would be fabulous to capture that change to do a 25-year study of this property and uh, perhaps make some lessons that are scalable across other restoration sites. And uh, also, because I came from the movie, documentary movie making business, perhaps make it more evident to the public what's happening. You can't see groundwater moving across the ground. You can't see the aquifer. You can't see where the glacier went out and you have 17 feet of peak. So people can walk around a nature sanctuary and it's very pretty and it has trees, but you're not seeing what's happening underneath. So I thought, well, that's a good challenge. Um, so we founded Living Observatory, science experience uh, and interpretation. I should say science interpretation and experience. Um, Alex, uh, we became a priority project for the Division of uh, Ecological Restoration. Beth Lambert is here today, thank you, uh, for making that possible. And uh, Alex became our project manager because as owners, we wouldn't have the slightest clue what to do next. Uh, our ecological goal, as Alex helped us define it, was to develop a system that is complex, adaptive, dynamic and self-sustaining uh, and we wanted to pay attention to driving natural processes and landscape connectivity. Now this fit with my idea of living observatory and hands-on, heads-on learning um, because I could connect with universities. That's what I do. That's the world I came from. So we went out and we saw some folks in Western Massachusetts, David Bout, who's a hydrologist, and some other folks. Um, and we 
put together an incredible hydrology team to look at the underlying way water is moving across the landscape. Uh, we went to University of Mass Boston and connected with somebody who was involved in Eel River, uh, Alan Christian, and we began to look at the invertebrate, the life on the property. More recently, we connected with Kate Ballantyne of Mount Holyoke College, who uh, is a fabulous woman who studies uh, with undergraduates mostly uh, restoration and uh, is particularly interested in the carbon cycle. And uh, the Media Lab, of course, uh, my old colleague and friend, Joe Paradiso, who runs the Responsive Environment Group, who looks at low power sensing. They had done a lot of low power sensing systems in a building, quite more easy to do. And our project launched them on a research of how to build these systems across a landscape. Um, Mariana, you've given us a good uh, taste of what it is. Can I, can I just do a quick, uh, 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 two uh, more slides and I'll do it very quickly. So our model is a sensor architecture with explorers and experts. We think of everybody as an expert at a moment and then they become an explorer for learning and sharing. That's what we're building. And uh, you can participate. I can talk about that later. But I want to thank, because we have so many sponsors, I really want to put that page up. Uh, and I want to thank everybody who has been a part of making this project happen. It's a big property, and it would have been a shame to let it just be a dirt bike racing property. <laughs> This slide does say a lot. I mean, this is really amazing in terms of outreach, uh, just getting more people involved, and it just multiplies ex exponentially as you do that. Uh, I, I seriously didn't want to cut you off, but we're going to get back to some more questions, and we specifically might want to ask about the types of sensors and the way you're feeding that to the internet, and then how all that data will become available to families. Uh, so we've got Duran dealing with students in school, we've got the Goyana dealing with multiple, multiple agencies and their constituents, and then also with the families that will be able to come and visit, as well as any individual that will be able to access all over the world via internet, living observatory. So Kim, uh, I'm not sure, is the speaker on the table working okay? I'll try that. Can you hear me? Hi, everybody. So I have a confession to make. I'm a history person <laughs> in a room of scientists, I think. Um, so I'm approaching this um, kind of from a historical background. So, I, and I can't let a, an excuse, or I can't let a moment go by without giving a little history lesson. So looking back to the, the theme of water, um, we all know water is, water is life. You really got to have it. Um, and the Wampanoag people knew this. They lived here for thousands of years. Um, they sought out fresh water and salt water. Um, in fact, the Wampanoag name for this area, you may know, is Patuxet, which means place of the Little Falls, talking about Town Brook and the, the ripples and the small waterfalls that were there. So they understood that. They knew it. The pilgrims kind of understood it. When they came over here, they looked around, they found a good place to live, they thought Cape Cod didn't have good enough water, so they came here instead. Um, they, and the reason I say they kind of understood it is even after they had been here for a couple of years, they sort of marveled at the health of the colonists and said, you know what's amazing, our children are so healthy and we only have water to drink. Not meaning not beer. <laughs> so they kind of got it, but they didn't kind of make that last quite connection yet. Um, so I work down at the Plymouth Grist Mill, which is a new um, exhibit for Plymouth Plantation. It used to be, you may have heard of it, called the Jenny Grist Mill. And that's all about water, too. We are literally on Town Brook. Town Brook runs underneath us. Um, and we're all about water power and rivers and water power and fish populations are often at odds with each other. And in fact, a little plug for our movie tonight, Damnation, is all about that. So 
when we started running the grist mill, we looked at it from a historical perspective because that's what we do. Um, we were really interested in the project because we realized that we could include technology and engineering and it became really quickly apparent that the environment um, was a huge part of the equation of the story that we could tell as well. So we get lots of people coming to visit us from all over the country and all over the world. Um, so we have an opportunity to tell this kind of interdisciplinary story involving the Native, you know, the Native American people, the Wampanoag, involving the colonists, involving science and technology and engineering. So we have lots and lots of ways of hooking people in and getting them interested. Before we started running the grist mill, we did a lot of research. Of course, we looked at our primary sources and found all kinds of wonderful stories. Um, and of course, one of them was about the herring. Um, one of the visitors to Plymouth Colony talked about how um, upon every tide, 10,000 herring would be brought into the brook during their spawning. And I think we've all heard the story of how, you know, the herring were so thick in the brook you could walk across the brook on their backs. And, and we all know the story of Squanto and how, you know, he taught the pilgrims how to farm using the alewives, using the herring as fertilizer. So we knew that this would all be a really important part of the story. We kind of we knew it in our heads. And then spring came, and then the herring started to run. And there they were in front of us. And some of them had seen, a, you know, seen it a little bit before, but um, I had never. So all of a sudden, there's this amazing spectacle of these tens of hundreds of thousands almost of alewives passing literally right behind the grist mill. We were fascinated. Um, and we found that our visitors were really fascinated too. And the people who were coming to the grist mill to hear about history sometimes didn't care so much about the history anymore when you had all these wonderful fish running by. <laughs> um, so we realized that we have a wonderful opportunity to help tell that story um, as well as the story of the impact of um, colonization and mills and dams on the brook. Um, so we have um, a couple of exhibit panels that we leave up in the exhibit all year long. So, you know, every day, every single day of the year that we're open, we're telling somebody about the herring and um, how that whole cycle works. And then we decided to have a, a festival to celebrate it as well because we liked it so much and we knew other people did too. So I feel a little bit funny talking about how to um, uh, develop community partnerships and put on a Herring Run Festival um, because we've only done it once. <laughs> <laughs> this is our second year, and last year it was there was torrential rain. So the people that came, and Lee was there, um, <coughs> it was wonderful, it was a great day, um, but we didn't get a lot of people. This but year... I, and I strongly recall that in the middle of the afternoon as it was raining, a bus like you. Asian tourists arrived <laughs> and got to our decorated herring table activity. And, you know, some of them did look a little bit like sushi once. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're doing it again. And this time we have the weather, like we were saying, the weather is on our side. It's supposed to be beautiful. And um, we have a lot of great activities planned. Some People, um, the Pine Barren Alliance is going to be there, a lot of environmental agencies, so we're really excited about this as a start. Um, and we think we have a great audience for it and great interests. So, how do, the question that we pose to us is, how do we do it? Um, and again, it's hard to know how successful we're going to be because it's only our second year. But in thinking about this, I thought the first most important thing and this is a good life lesson as well, I think, in general, is find people who really know what they're doing, who are well-connected and have resources. <laughs> I think that's what my mom told me when I was like dating as well. <laughs> but it's so true. Um, you know, we're history people. There are lots of people out there that you guys are connected with that know stuff that we don't know. So we need to be connected with those people. Um, so with watershed associations, with the town of Plymouth, they've been incredibly helpful. And with NOAA, um, who I am just blown away by. Um, I think it's partly the person that we've been dealing with. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but he's bringing six people with him tomorrow to the Herring Run Festival. Um, so 
find good partners is one, and then use their networks. Ask them to spread the word and send out emails and everything. Um, I'm meeting people every day that are like, oh, so your Herring Run Festival is this weekend. And I don't know how they know, but I'm glad they do, and I have a sense it's because of those partnerships. Um, just ask. Um, we've asked for some kind of crazy things, and usually people say no, but sometimes they say yes. Um, Eric from NOAA, Eric Hutchins, called up um, uh, an author, Doug Watts, who wrote a book called Ale Life from Maine, and said, hey, you want to come down to the Herring Run Festival? And he said, yeah, I think I do. And we said, we don't have any money. And he said, that's OK. So we ask. People just sometimes <laughs> do say yes. Um, ask in plenty of time, though. It's easier to say yes with six months' notice than with six days' notice. Um, uh, return the favor, figure out ways that you can help out other people as well. Plan, um, uh, plan uh, uh, or, uh, activities for a variety of audiences, like tonight we have the most more serious kind of damnation film event where we'll have um, Doug Watts will be there, the author, and we'll also have um, a panel discussion afterwards. But then kids are going to be decorating herring tomorrow and you know doing some really fun stuff too. Um, and then lastly, pray, pray for good weather. <laughs> so we'll let, call me on Monday, and I'll let you know if it all worked. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. And I think Kim exemplifies uh, the possibilities of planning an activity and publicizing it well and having good partners and, and really trying to make it fun and have families to accomplish your outreach and your impact. All right, so I think our timing is such that we'll open it up to questions from the audience, and if you don't have any, uh, believe me, I do have some, but go ahead and let's see what, uh, what's on your mind and who you want to ask. <coughs> Hi, my question is for you, Luann. I wonder if you've had any opportunity to engage the families, the parents of your students. Um, I do. In, in fact, I send a letter out the first day of my course where I kind of outline a little bit of my background and why I take their children out to the ocean and in the rivers and pond areas and forests with the kids and all you know, that. Um, and I invite them. I invite parents, people to come out. They have to get quarried. You know, they have to go through all kinds of things from the school district, but they do. And so um, I Great. They usually are helpful and interesting. It's very important for me to have that connection. Any questions? This question is for Gloriana. Um, Gloriana, I was wondering if you could describe some of the sensors that you're using and um, how um, people can can explore that for themselves and where they can find out about those. Um, so, this, uh, this is, this is on? Yeah. so um, we're uh, developing a low power sensor network. It's largely powered by solar, although wherever we have AC, we use it. And um, that's a little tricky. It's a huge site. Um, we have the first area, we have deployed sensors in the first area. The, the basic sensor is environmental, uh, measuring uh, temperature, moisture, light. I can't remember, anyway. Uh, onto that we hook uh, moisture, soil moisture would be one thing. Audio would be another. We stream live audio from the site. Uh, we have the opportunity, we're just working on um, some video. Uh, that will be streamed from the site. Uh, and then we have a virtual web, uh, a virtual site on the web that is, uh, that you can get to by going to <coughs> tidmarsh.media.mit.edu or just go to livingobservatory.org, I think also gets you there. And uh, uh, we use the Unity game engine, so you go into the Unity game engine, we put the topography of the site into that engine, and you can you can uh, you know virtually travel across it, or you can go into the visualizations and look at what the sensors are actually telling you. All of the data we collect and 
we're just now putting other data into that site. Uh, for instance, we've had sediment cores taken. The sediment cores are just becoming something you'll be able to see in the virtual world. Um, all of the data is open, uh, and all researchers working on the site have to uh, provide packets of their data to us that are formatted in a particular way. Um, in the earlier session, there was the discussion of how you get to some of this information. We're also building an MIT and an API called Chain API, which will allow anybody to put any kind of data into it and make it much more visible to the web because we see this as a problem, just a, a bigger problem. But um, so basically, if you go to the site, there are some little boxes that are distributed across the site. We're very interested in the micro. Uh, in, in the micro image. So if you're making a wetland, there's some areas of the wetland that will be drier and wetter, and there'll be some areas that have you know, more otters and fish, and some areas that have different kinds of plants and bugs. And we're very interested in capturing a very high resolution detail of the landscape. We're still working on the big science question. All right. I just, I'll just add that you initially did some of the mapping by bringing folks down from MIT and in Boston and other places yeah. with balloons and kites and cameras hanging from. Actually, that was um, Public Lab, which is a great lab to hook up with in Boston, a former grad of the Media Lab who makes low-cost technology, uh, different kinds, some for citizen science. Um, so they do some mapping. We're really struggling right now to have a plan for when they start the digging up the new channel so that we can update the topography of the site in sync with that um, digging of the channel, and we'll probably be using some drone technology for that. So, okay, I think we probably have time for one more question. partners and we were like June we're gonna start planning in June and then in September we made the first phone call um, so um, you know I think June would have been better and I think this year will be better about it um, and you know the more we can plan ahead the more people that we'll get um, you know I think what we're um, what we're thinking now is I'm wondering how to make it bigger you know we're stuck in a very small footprint right now where the Christmas site is small and we're using a lot that's owned by the town across the way but I would love to have it all along the brook so that kids can walk up and there'll be stations all along the brook where here they test water quality here they measure an life to see how old it might be here they do a count um, so I would love to see it throughout the whole thing with you know, I think we can have different areas for different stuff. So it's going to grow. Um, we're hoping, but the, I think the more it grows, the longer ahead we have to plan. <laughs> Thank you. There is also a pairing festival in Middleborough I'm aware of. And I think it was on the 10th and 11th of April. And uh, I read a newspaper account. I, I hoped to get over there, but I didn't. But I read that they had 7,000 people. Oh, wow. Is there anybody here? That's, that's really interesting because in our run the fish haven't even started yet. Okay, we have one minute left. I guess we have one more question. I all just want to get on that. <laughs> Meeting with these people individually and then lunch. Okay, good enough. Thanks.
that um, if our plenary speaker, Eric Wahlberg, or our, um, our intern, Leah Hardy, uh, asks to cut you in line, let them go, they, <laughs> they, need to, uh, they need to get set up. Um, and there's going to be two screens out there uh, for watching the uh, plenary talk. If you are going to run away quickly after lunch for some reason, um, remember to leave your name badge uh, at the front and don't forget your souvenir mug. Um, and just as a reminder, the men's room is over there, through that door, women's room over there, through that door. Um, and enjoy lunch. Um, we'll be starting a plenary talk in half an hour. Thank you.